Kathy, thank you so much for being here today. I'm super excited to get to interview you. I would love if you could introduce yourself. Yes, I am Kathy Nichols. I'm from Georgia. Um, I am a retired teacher for many years and finally got around to fulfilling my dream of writing and getting published. I have three books. The first one's called The Sometime Sister. Uh, the second is The Unreliables. And the third, which will be out in December, is Trust Issues. And all three of them, I decided I finally found a brand, which I didn't even know what a brand was for writing. Someone said, what's your brand? And I thought, I think I'm wearing Old Navy. So, I, But I had to learn. And my brand is Suspense with Heart and Humor. And I, as I said, I live in Lilburn, Georgia. I'm close to both of my daughters and my grandchildren. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I love that. Could you tell us what your books are about? Well, they're, they're, they all have a theme of loss and grief in them. But they're also, they show how humor can help you cope with that. And they're all mysteries. Every one of them has a murder. My husband is like, okay, should I sleep with one eye open? I'm like, well, if you're writing mysteries, you just really need to kill somebody. It's much more high stakes than a diamond got stolen. I don't care about that. So the first book really involves the relationship between sisters. And it has two sisters. And in it, the, the protagonist is Grace. And she has always adored her younger sister. Her younger sister's a bit of a diva. But they're still very close until her younger sister elopes to Ecuador with the man that Grace planned to marry herself. So that obviously puts a rift between them. When something horrible happens to the younger sister, Grace then has to deal both with looking for justice for her sister and also with dealing with not only grief, but guilt, because she never really got to resolve the issues with her sister. So unresolved issues becomes a kind of a recurring theme in all three of my books. In the second book, once again, I have someone who's lost someone. She happens to be an author. She's a very, um, not, sub, not conservative, but I'd say subdued, kind of normal person. Her husband has been killed. You learn that very quickly. And she has this strange reason for feeling some guilt about that. I won't tell you what it is because it's quirky and, and sad at the same time. But she has a book series that she writes and her character is, main character is named Garnet Rivers. And Garnet is everything that the protagonist of the book is not. Garnet is kind of wild. She's kind of sexy. She's out there. She She's strong. And throughout the book, uh, I'm exploring the creative uh, process and why, because Garnet starts talking to um, the the main character and Kara. And at first, Garnet just is repeating lines, you know, that Kara wrote for. But then Garnet kind of takes on a persona. And anyone who isn't a writer, or who has read about writers, might be thinking, well, she's losing her mind. And I'm sure that the first few times my husband came in on me and I was having a conversation with my character, he probably thought the same thing. But I don't think that writers are crazy. I don't think I'm crazy. I think it's just you have the symbiotic relationship with your characters. And that is sort of what I'm exploring in the midst of where our main character is also trying to find out what really happened to her husband? She doesn't buy that it was just a random act of violence. And trust issues, which is a little bit, uh, a little bit lighter. It opens with the line, um, "According to family legend, my mother was conceived in the back of a van immediately after the performance, jo Janis Joplin's iconic performance of Peace of My Heart." And so immediately you get this crazy grandmother character. The protagonist is the granddaughter. The mother, there's a generational thing going on. And the murder uh, is the mother of a young teenage girl. So we have three generations kind of interacting in different ways while they come try to come to terms with what's happened, with the danger they're maybe in. And there's a lot of humorous interaction among the generations, but it's also some serious uh, coming to terms with, as I said, grief and loss. And in June, the sequel to The Sometime Sister is coming out. It's gonna. It's called The Substitute Sister. And 
it will be published by that same publisher, Black Rose Writing, and sort of picks up where the first one leaves off. Amazing. So June 2023, correct? Yes, correct. What inspired you to write your book? Well, I come from a long line of storytellers, particularly on my father's side. There are also a bunch of characters on my father's side, some of them a little shady, most of them pretty funny, uh, all of them irreverent. So when I picked these stories up and repeated them, that did not thrill my mother, but I just loved the way they could captivate a group telling these stories. And I thought, well, I want to tell my own stories someday. And I wrote when I was younger. I wrote <laughs> probably when I was 11, I started writing and would call my poor friends up and read the stories to them. And I got through high school still wanting to write. In college, I took a creative writing course and I wanted to write. But I realized very quickly that I wasn't going to be able to contribute to um, my marriage and raising children on a writer's salary when I had nothing to put out there. So I taught school for a long time and I helped other people become writers. I kept a, not journals exactly, exactly, but like notebooks with snippets of ideas. And when I retired, I thought, you know, if I don't do this, I'm not ever going to do it. I better get busy. And I did. And I got an, I ha- I got an agent. She was, she was a good person, but we didn't click. And then I finally said, okay, I'm going to look for whatever I can find. And I found this great publisher who you don't have to have an agent, but they handle everything else. So it's great setup. And it's just been kind of, percolating since then. I I don't know when I'm going to stop when I run out of ideas, I suppose, but it's really been uh, very, very self-fulfilling. for me. That's so amazing. When you were writing your books, who were you thinking of when it comes to who your book is for? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Well, I think as a writer, you have to write something that you yourself would want to read. And then you have to think, all right, is it just for my age group? What is in it? And I don't think in terms of just people my own age. I'm fascinated with, well, I, my da- I have younger, obviously younger daughters. And then I taught high school and I was fascinated with teenagers and just the concept of where you are at different parts in your life and what you feel. So uh, first, I wanted to write something that I knew I would like to read, that my friends would like to read. And that hopefully my daughters would like to read. So that gives you a nice uh, wide kind of category. But also, I was a member of a petite group. And I don't know if you have aspiring writers who are listening. I highly recommend joining a petite group. You may have to shop around. I was extremely lucky. The, The first one, real one that I went to was great. And with their help, I was able to be held. I was accountable. I had to turn out something each week. We shared with each other. We gave um, kind, constructive criticism. And it really, really helped me. It also helped me to realize that maybe it wasn't just women who might be interested in my books. Because especially the first one, part of The Sometime Sister, is set partially in Ecuador. And there's a lot going on there uh, about the country and about uh, the government and of the people, the expatriates who live there. So I had some very uh, supportive male members of the group who also were, were saying, yeah, we would read this. It's still like, I can't, I hear all different percentages, but well over 80%, I think, of books are bought by women. And so you, you're doing well if you can hit a female audience. But I hate to say it's women's fiction because, I mean, there's no such thing. Women read everything. But on the shelf, there is. <laughs> so. I love that. How long have you been writing? Well, seriously writing uh, as soon as I retired. So I've been retired for like 12 or about 12 years. Before that, I was writing. But I wasn't writing with the goal of being published as soon as I could. I was writing with the goal of finding the style I wanted. And developing characters the way I wanted. And as an English teacher, I I made up my mind very quickly. I didn't care about writing the next great American novel. 
uh, I'd let someone else do that. And I like, I, I love Faulkner, but I realize now that if Faulkner were trying to get published today, I don't think he'd make it. His sentence, they say, keep your sentences manageable. His sentences go on for pages. His paragraphs go on for chapters. <laughs> and so I, I mean, so I wanted to write something people were going to read. And I know that I knew that I had to get busy and do that. So I would say over the course of about 12 years, I've written about six books. Uh, like I said, four of them are, I know will be published and I'm cleaning up another one and hopefully have an idea for a new one, but my head's spinning. So. I love that. What made you really sit down and start to write the books? Probably uh, my age. I mean, I I wished I had started seriously writing at uh, age 25. Truth is, I didn't have as much to say as I, at age 25 as I have to say now. I feel like I can, my my material is much more meaningful. Not that I couldn't have written about something that was topical and important and I was passionate about then, but I feel like I do have more to say now. But I also really was, you know, I've got to get it. I've got to say it. I've got to get it done. And and I have a particular point of view, as do all authors and all people. But I thought that mine might have something to offer to people. I had a serious loss in my own life. And I really felt like the concept of dealing with those emotions and trying to, you know, wrestle with how you're supposed to feel, how you're supposed to act, how you should be going. All of those things influence me to really get going with it. I love that. What is your schedule like when you're writing a book? (laughs) Well, I'm a new grandmother and uh, we moved. We'd been in a house for 36 years and my daughter moved to a place farther away from us. We decided that we would move closer to her and my older daughter it's the same distance. So I have dedicated a lot of time to helping with him because I didn't get to do that with my uh, older grandchildren. So I'm having to kind of revamp my schedule. I try to be, when I'm on, I'm really on. Before um, my grandchild, I wrote probably three to four hours, four to five days a week was my goal. And I would set goals of word counts. And, you know, that, so th- I didn't stop if I hit a goal, uh, one, but it, it kind of helped me stay grounded in, in it. Now I, my writing time is very dear to me and I really have to work the schedule. So I'm still working on the schedule right now, trying to figure out what it is, but I still can get, I'd say if I were to get two hours, four or five days a week, I could do what I need to do. More would be better and a writing retreat would be wonderful. (laughs) That's amazing. What do you need in your writing space to help you stay focused? Well, after teaching high school for all those years, I don't have a bit of problem operating in chaos. I mean, uh, I I was very good at um, continuing on a mindset with all sorts of things going around and still be able to hear somebody in the background make a comment. My hearing was just and it's still really good. The kids were like, "How does she do that?" <laughs> you don't want to know. But um, yeah, I I don't. I usually write uh, in a recliner in my uh, where there's lots of light. I do need lots of natural light. I don't. I don't operate well in little dark spaces, uh, possibly because. I taught some for a while with no windows. So I love to have that open uh, concept. And, you know, I prefer no interruptions, but I don't get freaked out if somebody bothers me. I can go back to it or ignore if I have to. So I, I know lots of writers, it really makes a difference to them where they are and how they set up. But I think especially women have to be flexible in everything we do. So for me, Flexibility in writing has been the key. I love that. What is your favorite writing snack or drink? Ooh, Cheetos. Cheetos and um, Coke Zero. Of course, you have to have the diet drink with the high caloric Cheetos. So it's a delicate balance. (laughs) Yes, it is. 
What books do you enjoy reading? Well, I'm really a strange reader. I'm a member of two book clubs right now. And one of the book clubs is lots of my former teacher friends. We don't hit super literary books, but like I read The Vanishing Half. I know it's by Brett, Brett, and I can't remember her last name, but it was a really cool book about uh, black twin women and one passed and one stayed in her environment. That was, that's been real popular. So I, I will read books like that. Um, but I'm in a book club with my daughter and her friends, and it's we we formed it. She helped get it together after a lot of the horrible things over the the past summers, the um, George Floyd and just you know some of the injustices. And there's a funny saying or meme that says, "What do white women do when they're upset by social injustice? They form a book club." So that's kind of what we did, but we wanted it to be more than that. So I've read a lot of things that I normally would not have read. Uh, We read the Michelle Obama um, autobiography. Yes, autobiography. We read, we've read, we read Jim Crow Hollywood, which was fascinating, but I don't recommend it as light reading. It's more like a textbook. So we, so I read just about everything. Of course, I love mysteries. That's, that would be my, that'd be what I'd be pulling off the shelf on my own without being pushed in, and as I, as I should be to read more. But I love, um, oh gosh, I'm Karen, I, I like Karen Slaughter, but she's sort of brutal. I have to space my things out with her. She has some different um, characters that get real rough. I, I just like, a, you know, if there's a book there, I'm picking it up and looking at it. So. I love that. Are there any books or authors that inspired you to become a writer? Um, well, you know, I hadn't thought about that until you just asked it, but I remember teaching. Maya Angelou wrote, uh, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings is book. I'm pretty sure it was Maya Angelou. And she told the story of her story of growing up. It was just it was brutal, but it was inspiring that she could create something of beauty from something that had been so hard for her. And I don't put myself in her category in any way, but I think that authors who do that, who are able to uh, come out of, of situations that are rough and they're able to maybe not even talk about the, that situation, but they're emotional the emotional toll it took they turn it into something positive and and there's energy and what they've written that other people can kind of draw from so that was inspirational to me and of course i like i said i love poor old faulkner he was he was a bit of a drunk but he was able to write you know i mean the man really truly had a drinking problem and but he wrote these beautiful things that came from, I know, dark places within, within him. Uh, he's my classic uh, author that I would go to. And just women that just put it out there. that they, they, they aren't afraid of, of being themselves. And they're not worried about showing their vulnerabilities through their writing. So. That's amazing. What books did you grow up reading? Did you have a favorite? I call myself a serial reader. When I was really young, and I'm sure we probably still have these, but they were the little blue biographies. And I think I started in the second grade. And they were, so, I mean, I still reading, re- remember reading about Amelia Earhart and Kit Carson and all these, and Edison and all these little things. And you could just, they were very, to me, easy to read. So I read those. And then I got into my dog phase and I read, there's Lad a dog and all of these beautiful dog stories. Most of them make you cry. And I got all cried out with that. And then I started in um, like Kings and Queens, like it, historical fiction. I went all out in historical fiction. And um, I also, I did true crime for a little while, but true crime disturbed me more than the fictional crime and even the rough fictional stuff that didn't bother me so much and oh I, oh Stephen King 
turn me on to all that that type of horror story. So, I, where am I now? I don't know where I am now. When you start writing, you just have to read as you can, you know, because you read and you feel like, oh, I should be writing. And you're like, yeah, but it's late and I'm tired. Yeah, but you need to rest so you can be writing tomorrow. <laughs> so my reading has suffered, this, which is why the book clubs are good for me. I love that. And it touches a little on this, this next question. As an, Now on the opposite side, as an adult, do you have a favorite series or a favorite author? Well, I love Margaret Atwood, uh, The Handmaid's Tale and Cat's Eye and Alias Grace. I, I like, I think she's got one out I haven't read and I've got to check into that. Um, so I really do, I, I enjoy, she's one that if she has a book out, I like to find it. I still like Stephen King. I mean, uh, a lot of my friends are like, they can't do horror. And I'm like, it's just a book. It's not like the real horror out there in the world that I don't want to do. I'm going to escape into this book. I can close when I need to. Um, so those are the two that pop out at me. And and like I said, oh, I, I loved all the case Scarpetti mysteries. I forgot. Oh, gosh, I can't believe I forgot the writer. But she hasn't been doing them for a while. So uh, she was a criminal, um, more not the ones that examine the dead bodies. I, I, my words are not coming to me today, but she, I like, I enjoyed that series. Yeah. Like I said, unless it's a really dull book, I'm probably going to get into it some. And, but I am good now. I used to be one of these people who, if I started reading a book, I thought I had to finish it. And I'd say 20 years ago, I said, please, I'm not doing that. And I urge other people not to do it. If you start a book and you don't like it, don't read it. There's so much else out there to read. Just go, so this is somebody else's cup of tea, not mine. And don't give it a bad review just because you don't like it. <laughs> I'm big on that. Don't be mean. <laughs> so true. So true. What would you tell someone just starting out with reading again? Ooh, always read what you like. Don't worry about what other people are saying. Um. And, and like I said, if you pick it up, you don't like it, move on. Don't ever, I talked to a lady uh, the other week and she was telling me that she, her ex-husband, I believe had, or maybe her husband anyway, had taught at Yale or Harvard and she was at parties with people and they would say things like to her, are you kidding? You've never read so-and-so and you've never done this. And I'm thinking, don't let anybody reading shame you you know if you, the only reason a lot of people have read those is because their high school or college teachers made them and and they had to read them some of them loved them some of them didn't but i i was just appalled that someone would say that it's so it's killing the spirit of reading i think so don't be ashamed read whatever you want to read start with magazines you know, read about books in magazines and say, and say, well, you know, I might want to look at that. If you see a movie and there's a book, wait a month or two and read the book because it's going to give you enough of an overview that you won't have any trouble following it. And I think most of the time you'll go, oh, this book is so much better than the movie. And then you'll, you'll branch out to that. If you find an author you like, keep on going with them. Don't worry if you, that's all you read. That's fine. That reading is for pleasure and it should make you think, but it can also take you away from your thoughts. I love that. On the opposite side of that, what would you tell someone just starting to write their own book? That I, I think I would say it's never too late. If that's what you want to do, do it. Have realistic expectations. Um, start writing and, and get the words on paper. If you, but as you do that, and when you're not writing, consider always consider your audience. It's one of the problems I had with somebody in the critique group because the book was so out there. I kept saying, "Well, who's your audience?" And he would say something like, "Oh, well, anyone who likes to read." No, no, it doesn't work that way. So be realistic. Find your audience. Know to whom you are writing, so that you don't um, get off track. And you, you realize, and if you're writing to her yourself, that's good. You know, you know what you like. So, because they're always, when you're trying to get your book published, they always ask you for comps. So you're like, well, what, what is my, 
not necessarily my genre, but my general type. So be, think about those things and write it, write, you don't have to write every day, but have some accountability. If you have a writing partner, they're good. A writing critique group is better. Both is the best situation, but then how do you ever have time to write if you're critiquing and doing all that stuff? So you have to find the balance. But you need, usually a writing partner is probably going to be too, too kind. A critique group is not going to be, you don't want one that's mean, just drop out of it if you don't like it. But you want one that's going to be honest with you and in a constructive way. And try to set your writing goal. Like I said, Get a critique group or a partner. Be realistic about your goals. But if you are writing to get published, don't think you can't do it. Don't. But also, don't think, oh, when you finish the book. Now, most writers aren't like this, I think, because most writers have imposter syndrome. We think, if you get a, when I got my first book published, I was like, okay, I better sign this contract really fast before they realize they sent it to the wrong person. And then when they took my second book, I thought, okay, so I really didn't feel any better about it. But the third book, I thought, okay, maybe I'm a writer. But, you know, most people have that problem. But a few people will think, okay, this book is so good. It's next on the Oprah charts, which she doesn't do it anymore. But yeah, she still has a book club. But Reese Witherspoon, you know, and, and don't be overly confident and be willing to accept criticism and rejection. Yeah, I told you way more. So the first thing is just write, write and write what you like I and then that. look for feedback. So good. So good. What is one thing that people are generally surprised to find out about you? Oh, I can have a very salty mouth. People that they don't usually wait too long to find that out about me, but I think I kind of give the impression of being um, not exactly sweet, sweet, but like you know, very moderate. And I'm and I'm not at all. I can I can shock people. <laughs> I love that. Is there anything you would like to say or add? Well, we have a slogan in um, the podcast. Wild women who write take flight. It's our it's our tagline at the end, and I said it's about writing. But I think you could say it about writing or reading. We say, until we see you the next time, keep writing and stay wild, because that's what it's about: being true to yourself, not worrying about what other people say, and getting getting telling your story the way you want to tell it. I love that. Where's the best place for readers to find your book? I know some readers love signed copies. Is that an option? And the best place that they can connect with you? Um, my, I have a um, website. It's kathy-nichols.com. I'm on Facebook, Kathy Stagner, S-T-A-G-N-E-R, uh, Nichols. I am available. My books are on Amazon. Bar, you can order them from Barnes & Noble, from Target, from just about anywhere you prefer to get your books, but it, you, most people have uh, at least some kind of crime and they get them for free. My first book, I mean, have a mail for free. I'm on Kindle Unlimited, so that's kind of free. And my first book, The Sometimes Sister, just came out on audiobook. So I know a lot of people are in the car and going places, and that's really convenient and pretty economical. So most places where you order books, you can find my book. I don't have the signed copy thing available, but my group is working on how we might figure out how to do that. So if I do, I'll post it on my website and everywhere else. Amazing. And the best place that they can connect with you? Uh, I would say my website. Send a, put a post a comment on my website because I will check that and get back. And, and um, I will sign them up for my newsletter as well. I have a, a monthly newsletter with things coming out. Uh, so far, I've only been at local book signings, and we're trying to branch out to different states. But we don't want to spend more money than we make on our books, so <laughs> that's a balance too. <laughs> so, so but I would love to hear. I love to hear from readers. Amazing, so true. 
Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. And we will drop those links in the show notes so that everyone can find them. And thank you so much again. It's been fun. I appreciate it.